first of all, I thought I ought to tell you why we're all here. Why has the Menzies Research Center organized this celebration of a little known event, the fusion? Professor Blaney will explain its significance in his speech, but there's a broader reason, and that is because the Liberal Party and the political tradition it leads are wantonly negligent in understanding, advancing, and defending our own history. Labor, on the other hand, draws enormous strength from it, highly, its own highly mythologized view of itself, and is given free range by the lack of commentary in its characterization of the past. We have no need for the extraordinary flights of creativity that Labor indulges in to demonstrate that liberalism and liberal governments have been the mainspring, the key creative force in the formation, development and success of this nation. Aside from its role as, uh, from, uh, from our traditional role as emergency paramedic after periods of Labor government. In Mr. Rudd's highly imaginative launch of Paul Kelly's latest book, Mr. Rudd's skills as a polemicist were more on display than those of a historian. However, it's our fault. Our fault on the Liberal side, this, this happens because we're too casual in protecting our achievements. And tonight is part of the MRC's attempt to deal with that. Thank you for all, all for being part of it. And I know quite a few of you have come a long way and have, done, uh, have gone to a lot of trouble to be here. I said I'd like to mention a number of our very special guests tonight, and one apology. We have three former leaders of the party here tonight. Brendan Nelson, Andrew Peacock, and his wife, Ambassador Penny Hall, and of course, Prime Minister, uh, ex-Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser and Tammy. We are delighted you're all here. As many of you are aware, John Howard had planned to be here tonight, but his plans became derailed last week for medical reasons, and he sends his apologies. I'm sure we all wish him a speedy recovery. We have descendants of two other leaders. I'm delighted that Heather Henderson, the daughter of Sir Robert Menzies, and her husband Peter are here tonight. Welcome, Heather. Going back a little further in time, Alfred Deacon had nine grandchildren. Three are still alive. His eldest and his youngest granddaughters are both here with us t tonight, with two of their sons. Jessie Clark is the senior granddaughter, and she's here with her son Francis and her daughter-in-law Vivica. <laughs> and also present is his youngest uh, grandchild, Judith Harley. <laughs> The, the Australian Native Association played an important role in supporting Federation and the new Liberal Party of 1909. The ANA is now part of the Australian Unity Group of Companies, and I'm very pleased that Alan Castleman, its chairman and former vice president of the Victorian Liberal Party, is here tonight, and the MRC would like to thank you for your generous support. I'd also like to acknowledge my fellow directors of the MRC, the Federal President, Alan Stockdale, the Executive Director, Julian Lisa, Arthur Sinodinas, Tony McClellan, and David Kemp. This weekend in Sydney, we will launch our next publication, So Many Firsts, Liberal Women in Cabinet by Margaret Fitzherbert, which chronicles the significance of women at the centre of the Cabinet system, commenced by Dame Enid Lyons, widow of Joseph Lyons, um, in the Menzies government, with six other remarkably talented women cabinet ministers, two of whom are here tonight, the Federal Dep Deputy Leader Julie Bishop and former Senator and Cabinet Minister jo Jocelyn Newman. <laughs> also present are current Senate Leader Nick Minchin and his Deputy Erica Betts. Uh, I'd also like to warmly welcome back to Australia the longest serving Senate Leader, in not only our party's history, but in the history of the Senate. Robert Hill, who's just returned <laughs> after completing a very, very distinguished service as our ambassador to the UN. Other shadow cabinet ministers are George Brandis, Michael Keenan, and Sharman Stone. The leader of the Liberal Party in the ACT Assembly, Zed Seselja, 
the Federal Treasurer, Michael Yabsley, Federal Vice Presidents, Daniel Blaine and David Russell, Divisional Presidents of Western Australia, Barry Court, uh, Bruce McIver of Queensland, and uh, Winifred Rosser of the ACT, the Federal Director, Brian Lochnane, and the party's State Directors. And please excuse me if I've left anyone out. <laughs> please enjoy uh, the entree. Before I introduce our guest of honour, I'd like to correct an error I made before, and I, I do apologise. I overlooked the presence of the National Women's Committee of the Liberal Party, um, chaired by Robin Nolan from Western Australia, but the chairman of the Women's Councils of South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, Queensland and the ACT are all present, and you're all extremely welcome. Thank you for coming. Geoffrey Blaney is correctly recognised as one of Australia's most significant historians. His book, Tyranny of Distance, is one of, if not the best-known single work on Australian history. He's published over 30 other titles, including The Triumph of the Nomads, one of the earlier scholarly works appreciating Aboriginal culture. He's rightly respected for both his scholarship and for his capacity to communicate and make history both accessible and interesting. He takes on the biggest and broadest topics, and I gather he has recently commenced a history of Christianity. Um, his generosity and intellectual curiosity know few bounds. We were so pleased when you accepted our invitation to speak tonight Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Geoffrey Blaney. Uh, Mr. Chairman, honoured guests, I too feel honoured uh, to be in the company here tonight and in the presence of those looking down upon us. Uh, Tom's generous remarks reminded me of the pilot of the little plane who used to call it a sheep station near Broken Hill. He landed this day and the owner of the station came over and the pilot said, have you still got that wonderful dog of yours? The owner said, yes, he's over in the shed playing poker. They went over and there were three men on the floor and the dog, the cards in front of them and the pilot said, he's the cleverest dog I've ever heard of. The owner said, he's not really clever at all. Whenever he gets a good hand, he wags his tail. <laughs> the chairman makes me feel like a clever dog. <laughs> In 1901, when the Commonwealth of Australia was born, Sydney had fewer people than it has today. Sydney then was not quite the largest city but was just about to pass Melbourne. Wool and gold were our great exports and more important to Australia than our mining exports are today. They were very dry years and the two driest years since we've had nationwide rainfall records were about to come 1902 and 1905. We've had Australia-wide no two dry years since. It was a time when Australia was very isolated and the members who came to the first federal parliament from Western Australia and Tasmania and North Queensland had to make all or part of the journey by sea. The Northern Territory or the Northern Territory of South Australia as they called it was even more isolated. The Aborigines, the Aboriginals, full descent were even more isolated and were believed wrongly to be dying out. Could I just say a few words about the beginnings of the fusion or the combined Liberal and Free Trade Party? You can see the leaders there, Edmund Barton, the first Prime Minister, Alfred Deakin with the beard, then Sir George Reid, the leader of the Free Traders, and then Sir jo Joseph Cook, who was the uh, Prime Minister of Australia for a fusion or a Liberal government the, uh, in 1913, and then, of course, there's Billy Hughes, but more of him later. <laughs> the first years of the Commonwealth of Australia were an unusual experiment. In 
nothing like it was seen in the beginnings of the three older federations, the United States, Switzerland and Canada. There was nothing like it when the Parliament of the European Union met for the first time in 1979. The Federal Parliament meeting in Melbourne in 1901 had a glut of leaders. There was another hazard. Initially, the New South Wales and the Victorian members who would dominate the ministries of the new Parliament brought with them party loyalties that were not easily grafted onto the new National Parliament. Meeting for the first time in Melbourne, they did not form one party. They emphatically formed two, the Liberal Protectionists and the Free Traders. And why not? In New South Wales and Victoria were different realms. The new Commonwealth Parliament held three main parties. The smallest was the Australian Labour Party. Its leaders were mostly inexperienced and none had taken part in the creation of the Federation of which they now were a vital part. They were to win far more success than they had expected. But in World War I, they virtually dis disintegrated for a few years. There were two years when the Labour Party had only one member of the Senate. He was not surprised when he was elected leader of the, opposite, leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> In May 2001 at the Centenary Federation, Labour celebrated their longevity with justifiable pride. A hundred years is a long time in politics. The Liberal Protectionists, the largest party in 1901, largely reflected the political history of Victoria, which liked interventionist governments. Victoria traditionally imposed a strong tariff against most imports, not only those from Britain, but also from New South Wales, Tasmania and elsewhere. Victoria was a pioneer in initiating the short working week and a minimum wage in many industries. It encouraged occupational health and safety in a humble way. It imposed a tax on large landed estates, a tax which was called communistic at the time. The Liberal pro protectionists, the sponsors of these reforms, were helped very much by the Melbourne Age newspaper. Those were the days. Its editor, David Syme, an intellectual Scot, was a soul mate of Alfred Deacon. The age of support was vital. It had the largest circulation by far of any newspaper in Australia. In Victoria, as late as the third federal election, Labor could win only four of the 22 seats in Victoria. Three were those inner suburban or industrial seats now seen as hardcore Labor. In Victoria in 1906, the only other Labour seat was rural Wannon, which later became the electorate of Mr Malcolm Fraser, with us tonight. Farmer McDougall was the Labour member for Wannon. He caused a stir when he commenced his first election campaign by standing on the platform and being so frightened he was speechless throughout the evening. <laughs> Many people said he would make a good member of Parliament. <laughs> The Liberal Protectionists brought to federal politics their Victorian banners. They were bolstered by a cluster of members from other states. In one sense, the Liberal Party of 1901 was the party of the great fathers of federation. They included Edmund Barton and William Lyon of New South Wales, Alfred Deacon and John Cook, Kick, Quick and Isaac Isaacs and Simon Fraser of Victoria. John Downer and Charles Cameron Kingston and Thomas Playford of South Australia, John Forrest of Western Australia, who was perhaps the greatest of all our land explorers and missed being leader of the Liberal Party in the Federation by one vote. And then, of course, there was Elliot Lewis and Philip Fish of Tasmania and notable Queenslanders, including Dixon. In spirit, many Liberals, but far from all, were close to the early Labour Party. They therefore usually gained Labour's support, led by Edmund Barton, and then for a much longer period by Alfred Deakin. They dominated federal politics for seven and a half of the first nine years. <laughs> 
The alliance became so cordial that at one election, Labour refused to stand candidates against most of the sitting Liberal members. For a total of just one year in all, Labour was allowed to govern in the first nine years. It then relied on the protectionist Liberal support. This political cuddling was rather like an alliance between Mr Turnbull and Mr Rudd. It was not likely to last. <laughs> there was a third federal party, George Reed's Free Trade Party. There's Sir George Reed with the old-fashioned white shirt and tie, third from the left. Reed's Free Trade Party in 1901 gained nearly half of its seats from New South Wales, his home state. Reed's party is often called conservative, but by English standards, he certainly was not conservative. He himself had been Premier of New South Wales for five years with Labour support. In the new Commonwealth Parliament, Reed's party sat in almost permanent opposition. The only exception was 11 months when it governed the nation. Even then it had to form a coalition with a small group of Liberal protectionists known as the reed mclean government, they were equal in their power. It was highly multicultural in the light of the times, for Reed was a Presbyterian and a free trader from East Sydney, and Maclean was a Catholic and a protectionist from Gippsland. <laughs> the coalition, which ended in 1905, showed that anything was possible. <coughs> the long marriage between Liberal and Labour was almost certain to end. The Australian Labour Party was becoming more radical. It was also entitled to feel more confident because by 1905 it was probably the most successful Labour or Social Democratic Party to be seen in the world up to that time. In other lands there was no party commanding the electoral support commanded at that time by the new Labour Party in the Australian Commonwealth. Labour was now hoping if it became the dominant party to nationalise the iron and steel industry, it wouldn't have taken much time in those days, to tax heavily the large pastoral properties around Australia and con control the Australian banks. That witty orator, George Reid, certainly saw Labour as a growing menace. His free trade party was becoming known as the anti-socialist party, for he was intent on slaying what he called the socialist tiger. The socialist tiger will gobble you all up, he warned. Alfred Deakin, by then leader of the Liberal Protectionists, began to listen. He listened partly for electoral reasons. His own party was being squeezed out by Labour on the left and the anti-socialists on the right. Moreover, Deakin was finding Labour less palatable. He had been a good friend of J.C. Watson, the Labour leader, a man whom nearly everybody liked. But Watson's successor, George Fisher, or sorry, Andrew Fisher from Gympie in Queensland, was more radical and less personable. Deakin and many of his colleagues were also perturbed by the discipline imposed by the Parliamentary Labour Party and by Labour's federal conference on its own politicians. It was a tradition of the British Parliament and imitated in the Australian parliaments that a member had full freedom to say what he thought. Labour was beginning to challenge this tradition. Its national conference and its federal executive had a tendency, increasingly, to dictate to the parliamentary party. Some of you will remember Sir Robert Menzies in the 1960s making great political mileage when he observed the leaders of the parliamentary Labour Party out in the open air, awaiting the verdict of what Mr Menzies called the 40 faceless men of Labour's executive. Most of the faceless men were not even members of the exec parliament. In 1909, this whole topic was like a stick of jellignite. The free parties, in short the non-Labour parties, valued the parliamentary traditions and the freedom of the individual member. They did not even wish for a strong party organisation because it might interfere with them. So for a variety of reasons, the alliance between Deakin and Labour faded away. In November 1908, Labour decided to govern 
in its own right, relying on support from Alfred Deakin and his party. The Labour caucus actually elected the members of the new ministry and Andrew Fisher allocated the portfolios. It was seen by some as a further blow to the parliamentary traditions of the time. So George Reid's anti-socialist party, as increasingly it was called, renewed its feelers to Deacon and his colleagues. It was said that the time had come to fuse. Fuse was the word it preferred. We would now use the word merge. George Reid was now ready to step down as his party's leader, and that was a helpful and gracious step. He was soon to live in London as our first High Commissioner, and he ended his political career as a member of the House of Commons. Would Deakin's Liberal Party agree to merge? His members met, only 17 of them, in Parliament House in Melbourne. They agreed by 11 votes to 6 to fuse or merge with the anti-socialists. <coughs> to lead the new party, Alfred Deakin, was the likely choice. He had served by far the longest as Prime Minister of Australia. He was one of the finest orators in the English-speaking world, and he had initiated, usually with Labour's help, most of the innovations of the early federal parliaments. There was one hidden weakness, the mental ailment which would end his parliamentary career and cut short his life was now visible to a few close observers. Though only 53 years old, he was beginning to lose his memory. At first, Deacon was reluctant to lead the new United Party. For eight years, he'd been the target of frequent attack from the anti-socialists or free traders, and now he was to be their friend and leader. For eight years, he had been the friend of Labour, and now these former friends would understandably turn around and denounce him. He accepted the post as leader of the new Liberal Party in May 1909. The name Liberal is significant. It still saw itself as a reformist party. His party was the first to have a majority in the House of Representatives as a result of the merger. So he gave notice to the Labour Party, and on the 2nd of June 1909, he became Prime Minister again with Joseph Cook, a former Labour man, fourth on the left, as his deputy. They had less than a year to make their mark, and then the next federal election would fall due. One decision of Deakins proved vital. He placed overseas an order for the first big warship for the Australian Navy, the Australia, and she arrived in Sydney just in time at the outbreak of World War I. Looking back, the first fusion was really an astonishing birth, for here was the traditional governing party and the traditional opposition party, parties at loggerheads during the opening decade of Federation, actually merging. What were the voters to make of such a merger? The election in April 1910 was a blow for Deakin. His united Liberal Party was defeated decisively, and he was lucky to win his seat of Ballarat. Despondently, he wrote to his sister overseas, this is the Waterloo, this is the Waterloo of the Liberal Party. He predicted Labour would be in power for many years. <clears throat> how quickly in politics, and who am I to say this in this gathering, how quickly in politics the giant Ferris wheel halts and reverses in 1913, the Liberals, now under Joseph Cook, Deacon had retired, won narrowly. Then Labour won again, just when World War I was beginning. But in 1917, Labour experienced the first of the ructions and splits that would prove so disastrous. It split over the question of support for the war effort. Some say it split over conscription, but it was more than that there was a substantial minority in the Labour Party who really wanted to end the war. As a result, the Labour Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, and a band of supporters moved to the Liberal Party. 
In the first 20 years of the Commonwealth Parliament, there was one notable loser, the huge family of small-scale farmers, the people once called cockatoo farmers or cocky farmers. Agriculture then employed more people than did manufacturing, but most farmers paid a price for the new federal policies. The shorter working week, the sunshine harvester judgment, the preference accorded to trade unionists, the basic wage, the new regulation of coastal shipping, they all meant nothing to farmers except higher costs. Australia's farmers, except the sugar growers, received no protection. They were slow to respond with effective political action. In December 1918, a month after the end of the war, a by-election for the Victorian rural seat of Camp Parangamite was held. For the first time in a federal election, the new system of preferential voting, a Liberal initiative, was applied. Labor would have won easily under the old method of first past the post, but the Farmers' Union had nominated their candidate and he easily won on, premises, on preferences. In 1919, in a by-election for the seat of Ichuka, the Farmers' Union won again. Soon this third party, under the name of the Country Party and later the National Party, virtually covered the continent. In February 1923, it joined a coalition with the Liberals, the so-called Bruce Page government. Stanley Melbourne Bruce, you can see him there next to Billy Hughes, Stanley Melbourne Bruce and Earl Page, between them, had been in Parliament for a mere seven years, including, un including one year with ministerial experience. This remarkable alliance of Liberals and Country Party was really the second fusion. The first was in 1909. The second and more informal fusion was in 1923, but just as important as the first. Henceforth, it became normal for the Liberals in the Federal Parliament to form coalitions with the Country Party or the Nationals. During the remainder of the 20th century, the Liberals and the Country Party usually worked together effectively. One secret of the extraordinary success of Sir Robert Menzies was his working relationship with the Country Party leaders Arthur Fadden and John McEwen. The same was true for Mr Fraser and Mr Howard in their long periods of government. To return to 1909, that first fusion, which we honour tonight, carried painful lessons. Patience was one, a willingness to find a middle way while maintaining the faith was another. These lessons were learned. Perhaps no other political parties in the history of the democratic world have gained so much for so long from a series of fusions and coalitions. You can't have such a series with a lot of wisdom. Kim Beasley, in an eloquent tribute to the Parliamentary Labour Party, in the book called True Believers, you wouldn't guess that name, <laughs> made this tantalising assertion. All other parties, he was speaking of the history of the Commonwealth, all other parties have taken as their fundamental point of identity and unity, such as it has been, the fact that they oppose Labour. I very much doubt whether this is true. The leaders of these pioneer parties, the Free Trade and the Liberal Protectionist, had largely created the Commonwealth. They came with their own clear aims, most of which they still pursued, after the two parties had merged. They had failures, as we all do, but their successes stood out. So did their distinctive viewpoint. They wanted a stronger Australia. They wanted to defend it effectively against threats arising suddenly in a perilous world. They wanted a more prosperous Australia with the aid of the vast free trade zone spanning the continent and Tasmania, the largest free trade zone ever created in the world up to that time, in one step. They wanted a nation where the people were encouraged 
to build their future by their own efforts and skills, but also be protected by a public safety net if they failed in their goals. They believed in rights, but an umbrella of responsibilities to match and sustain those rights. They wished to maintain their British links for Australia's defences, sea lanes, commerce, culture, religions, sports and legal and political institutions were tied loosely or tightly to those of the British Isles in that era. The Liberals believed ardently in a federated Australia, trusting that it would best serve the diverse resources and climates and peoples of a vast continent. They believed, and they were right, that a federation was essentially more democratic than a centralised or unified political system. A federation was also more efficient if regularly oiled and greased. In contrast, the Labour Party showed a growing desire to elbow aside the states and, if they could, extinguish the federation. The new Liberals combined the Conservative and the Radical, believing that their nation had inherited vital traditions from the past and should usually retain them. They also accepted, much more than the Labour Party, that the latest discoveries in science and technology could revolutionise the daily lives of the average Australian man, woman and child. I must conclude. Looking at the portrait of Alfred Deakin, I'm reminded of his favourite poet, George Essex Evans. Like many of the early Australian poets, he's barely read today, but he has a monument on the escarpment just outside Toowoomba in Queensland. He was Deacon's favourite poet and several of George Essex Evans' lines caught the imagination of the Liberals of that period. The poem or the verse began simply, not as the song of other lands our song shall be, not as the song of other lands our song shall be. The Liberals were proud to be Australian. They were not blind nationalists, but they hoped that with the help of vision and hard work and hard thinking, this nation might prove to be distinctive, that it might sing not the song of other lands. How it would be distinctive, they did not exactly know. They were not primarily central planners or utopians. They carried their own torches, their own values to light the way. In a moment, I'm going to invite Malcolm Turnbull to propose a formal vote of thanks. And following that, Julian Lisa, the executive director of the MRC, who's been responsible for our very extensive program, uh, will just make a few closing remarks. Before I introduce Malcolm, I want to take one or two minutes to talk about the catalogue of under-celebrated achievements of the liberal political tradition in Australia and why we should resist Labour's attempts at intellectual larceny. This is by no means complete and is largely off the top of my head. As Geoffrey mentioned, you only have to start with federation itself. Australia only came into being despite the efforts of the Labour Party. The Labour Party opposed it at every referendum. In the early governments, pre- and post-fusion, the critical architecture of the national institutions were put in place. The High Court, the Navy, the early welfare systems of old age pensions, the Commonwealth Literary Fund, the Navy and the preparations against Germany in World War I, and the initial steps in the US alliance with the visit of the Great White Fleet. These were steps taken by Deacon, Reed and Cook, sometimes with Labour's support, sometimes without. Hughes, after the Labour split, completed the First World War and fought for Australia's interests in the peace talks 
and for veterans' welfare. Bruce established the CSIRO, seeing the power of science, and rebuilt the economy from the ravages of war. They also completely reconstructed the federal state financial system. Joseph Lyons was one of Australia's most popular prime ministers, who undertook the recurring task of rebuilding national finances ravaged by a combination of the Depression and the Scullin government, he having split from it over the conduct of public finance. Shortly after the election, uh, somebody noted that the last time a Prime Minister lost his seat in an election was 1929, when Stanley Bruce lost his, his seat and the Scullin government was elected. That was a one-term government. Um, the only problem with that historic analogy is that when we came back into power, it was under the leadership of Joseph Lyons, who'd started as the deputy leader to Scullin. I don't think anyone here would like Julia Gillard to lead us back into power. <laughs> the first Menzies government saw the establishment of diplomatic relations with the US in anticipation of their entry into the war, plus the most strenuous support for Australia's interests in the conduct of the war with Menzies spending considerable time in Britain fighting for Australia's interests in the War Cabinet. The US alliance, so fervently claimed by Labor, has more to do with the fusion government and Menzies than it has to do with them. Menzies' post-war administration, branded by Labor as the Rip Van Winkle years, saw the ANZUS Treaty, trade practices laws, state aid to church schools, expanding choice for education, the massive expansion of tertiary education and science and technical education. It was a true education revolution that actually changed educational opportunity in Australia, not just the headlines. It saw the creation of many of the great, inst great national institutions of the city, that government, and the full establishment of a highly regarded and fiercely independent public service. It shepherded perhaps the, the longest period to date of Australia's prosperity. It was Harold Holt, in the face of Labor recalcitrance, that ended the white Australia policy and conducted the referendum to give Aboriginals the right to vote. It was the Gorton government that built a national health scheme, arts and environments department, a national film and television school, research uh, into protect and protection of the Barrier Reef, and restrictions on certain forms of foreign investment. It was the McMahon government who established the first federal government machinery or Department of Aboriginal Affairs. The Fraser government tackled, I say it again, the recurring problem of a hideous economic mess that is the unspoken legacy of the Whitlam years. It res he restored the standards of integrity and probity in the conduct of public office and built them to new and higher standards. He, est he established a meaningful form of multiculturalism that transformed the nature of our society, making it possible for the successful acceptance of Indo-Chinese refugees. It had a zero tolerance policy on racial intolerance, and that was rec recognized and respected globally. He commissioned the Campbell Report and started the process of economic reform. It laid the blueprint for the successive decades of economic liberalization. He also intervened to give environment environmental protection of the strongest kind to date at a federal level, saving Fraser Island and the Wales. Um, the Howard government is now being stereotyped as another Rip Van Winkle period. Without giving an exhaustive list, off the top of my head, I can think of a number of country-changing measures. The GST, gun control laws, the leadership on East Timor, the Environment, Pro Environment Protection and Biodiversity Convention Act that Robert Hill introduced, the massive rebuilding of defence, the continual refinement and protection of the financial system, the Future Fund, the doubling of overseas aid and medical research funds, and the National Water, Water Program, taking control of the Murray. That was some long sleep. I've listed these things and do not attempt to be comprehensive, but just to remind us of the rich set of achievements. They were achieved by men and women of vision who took bold actions had a vision of Australia and the world. These people are not fiddling bureaucrats or conservatives set upon a status quo or reactionaries. As Sir Robert Menzies said, we took the name Liberal because we were determined to be a progressive party, willing to make experiments, in no sense reactionary, 
but believing in the individual, his rights and his enterprise, and rejecting the socialist panacea. Tonight has not about been about wallowing in the glow of past glories. It's about the pride we can take in them and the inspiration and the courage they give and the qualities required to carry them forward. Malcolm Ca Turnbull captures all these qualities, boldness, intelligence and vision. He displayed them in government and will do so again. I would now like to call on Malcolm Turnbull to propose the vote of thanks. Well, thank you very much, Tom. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here tonight uh, with so many dear friends, uh, distinguished former leaders of Australia, leaders of the Liberal Party, uh, Brendan Nelson, Malcolm Fraser, Andrew Peacock, uh, Julie Bishop, my deputy, and uh, all my, so many other parliamentary colleagues, uh, so many leaders of our, of our party's uh, organisation. Uh, this is truly a great night. And can I say to you, Tom, and Julian Lisa, the Executive Director of the Menzies Research Centre, how much I appreciate, and I think we should all appreciate, uh, your staging tonight's event, because what you said at the outset is very true. On our side of politics, we do not do nearly enough to celebrate our history. Uh, we have an extraordinary record of achievement. We could not possibly imagine Australia in the form it is as a federation to begin with, without the contribution of the men and women of the Liberal Party and its predecessors, right back to be even before the Federation itself. So we have a great legacy, and it's good that the MRC is showing the leadership to ensure that it is remembered. Now, we've been very privileged to hear from you, Geoffrey, tonight. Uh, you are one of our countries, indeed one of the world's most distinguished historians. Uh, you gave us an astute an insightful analysis of why the fusion of the free traders and the protectionists a hundred years ago proved so important in shaping the evolution of modern Australia through the 20th century. <coughs> Professor Blaney has indeed tonight honoured history with the respect it deserves by being felicitous to the facts and by shunning partisanship and political posturing. I'm afraid to say I have to contrast this with the selective <laughs> and self-serving view of history we heard earlier this week from that Bradman of boredom himself, the Prime Minister, in yet another tedious innings. Uh, he, he showered us with a series of essays. Uh, all of them now, contra each one contradicts the one that came before. You remember the one at the beginning of the year in which he said that the world has, was crippled by the product of 30 years of neoliberalism, extreme neoliberalism, of which uh, John Howard and Peter Costello were the most recent exponents in government, government and of course I and my colleagues are the most, uh, you know, the current exponents uh, in, uh, in the parliament. Uh, but of course in that history of neoliberalism, that denunciation, he naturally uh, had to include Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. They were all damned together all neoliberals because they believed in the free market. And he said in that essay in the monthly, he said the government must be at the centre of the economy. Okay, that was, that was the story in February. Uh, and then at the launch of Paul Kelly's book, which I know a number of you went to that launch. Um, this is Paul's latest book, The March of Patriots, uh, which inc incidentally, when, um, when the Prime Minister launched he actually launched, he, he said, and I now have great pleasure in launching the March of Politics. <laughs> Think about it. It's all about politics. Now, I, everyone says being leader of the opposition is a tough job, but there was probably nothing more excruciating than the position I had on that occasion because I was trapped in the front row and couldn't leave. <laughs> uh, a number of my colleagues had wisely hung back towards the end of the room and were able to slip out. <laughs> But I was trapped. I've, uh, the speech he gave there, which, uh, which has been you know, given wide publicity, uh, claimed that, in fact, the only party that had engaged in economic reform, uh, and in fact the only party that had contributed to the creation of modern Australia, was the Australian Labor Party. And he laid claim 
to the same neoliberal Hawke and Keating legacy that he had denounced in February, claimed it as his own and said that there, nothing at all had been done under, Hawke, under Howard and uh, Costello. He claimed then, as he, as he has done all this week in the Parliament, that the economic strength and resilience that has buffeted Australia from the worst effects of the current global downturn can be ascribed either to reforms delivered by his Labor predecessors, uh, who of course uh, went out of office in 1996, or to his own government's wasteful and reckless spending, which of course began when he was elected at the end of 2007. Now these claims are as audacious as they are mendacious. They are both graceless and ungenerous. He, Kevin Rudd treats the recent history of our nation as a political plaything, something to be manipulated in the Orwellian style of the big lie. And we think of that great uh, prophetic novel of uh, George Orwell's 1984 with the unfortunate uh, Winston Smith, of course, who's employed by the Ministry of Truth, which has nothing to do with truth, it's all about lies, um, when he's confronted with uh, facts of history that, uh, that, di that are disagreeable to his, to his masters, he has to drop them down the memory hole where they are obliterated. Uh, of course, it's interesting history with Winston Smith. He came to a bad end after being betrayed by his girlfriend, Julia, but that's another story. <laughs> anyway, I'd encourage, you, I'd encourage you all to read the book. It's, uh, it's worth it. There it is. There it is. I, I, I leave it to you to ponder the significance of that connection. But the, the reality is that you can't airbrush history aside. And that is what Kevin Rudd has uh, been endeavouring to do. And it is, it is audacious because he has the capacity to say one thing at the beginning of the year about history and then the complete reverse this week. He has the capacity to look down the lens of the camera and unblinkingly say things which he must know as an intelligent man are completely and utterly untrue. It is, it is remarkable. And I don't think we've ever had a leader uh, of our country that is as audaciously uh, mendacious in his treatment of history as Kevin Rudd. Because when we think about it, you think about, think about our, our previous, you know, our most immediate past Prime Minister, John Howard, undoubtedly a stalwart political partisan, a ferocious political partisan. John Howard never failed to acknowledge the contribution of the economic reforms in the governments of his predecessors, Paul Keating and Bob Hawke. Never failed to acknowledge it. Always noted that the, you know, the reforms had been supported by the opposition and always complained that the Labor Party didn't support our reforms when we were in government. That was a fair comment. But he was always prepared to do that. Kevin Rudd will give our side of politics nothing. We are like, for him, like somebody who has been, who was purged, you know, in the Soviet era and is then uh, removed from all previous party photographs, becoming a non-person. It is an extraordinary, it, it, is, it is audacious and it's extraordinary and the risk that we run, as I said to the party room this week, is that if we do not stand up for our history, if we do not call him out and demonstrate and repeat and reiterate our contribution, the lie will start to become ex as the accepted version of events. It is vital that all of us, at every opportunity, tell the truth about our history, because we cannot count on any generosity of spirit from our opponents. Now, let us consider why Australia's recent economic performance has been so strong. There are, there are a number of factors. And not one of these factors that I'm going to mention now have been acknowledged by the government. In fact, they've been expressly denied. They have, no, they have nothing to do with it. The facts, my friends, we entered this crisis with the strongest financial system in the developed world, largely due to the prudential and regulatory framework put in place after 1996 by the coalition. 
we did not have a subprime crisis in Australia. We did not have a financial crisis in Australia. We did not have banks collapse in Australia. Why was that? What was the difference? It was our regulation, our prudential management put in place by our side of politics, by the Liberal Party and the National Party in coalition. We went into this downturn with zero net debt at the Commonwealth level and $45 billion cash in the bank, one of the strongest balance sheets in the world. So many of the other developed countries went into this downturn, to downturn hocked up to the eyeballs already, the United States being a very good example. We didn't. And that was thanks to a decade of budget surpluses and the repayment of labour debt by John Howard and Peter Costello. We had and enjoyed an open and deregulated economy with a highly efficient export sector focused on our immense natural resources and close economic relations with China and other fast-growing Asian economies. That was a result of a quarter century of economic restructuring under the Hawke, Keating and Howard governments and with a framework and a foundation laid by Malcolm Fraser when he was Prime Minister. None of that is acknowledged. None of that is acknowledged by Kevin Rudd. We have a mature and flexible labour market, again due to a quarter century of deregulation both sides of And finally, the biggest stimulus that we had to uh, respond to this downturn was, of course, the monetary easing, the, the reduction in interest rates delivered in 2008 and 2009 by the Reserve Bank of Australia, whose credibility and independence reflects the legislative protections provided to it by the coalition in government, which of course were strenuously opposed by the Labor Party. Now all of those advantages, or all of those assets, financial assets, economic assets that we went into this downturn with, reflected a legacy of economic and structural reform under our, under our government, under John Howard, and of course uh, under the reforms of the Hawke and Keating period. And as Tom said, following on a foundation that was laid in advance by Malcolm's government. Now we are not so conceited to claim all the credit. We acknowledge that there have been considerable contributions from both sides of politics. But history will nonetheless record that under the, in the years of the Howard government, Labor and opposition voted against virtually every one of the Howard government's reforms to strengthen Australia's economic performance. They opposed the first round of workplace relations reforms, which introduced AWAs and outlawed the worst excesses in the old industrial relations system, such as no ticket, no start. They opposed strenuously waterfront reform. They opposed, as I noted, giving the Reserve Bank independence. They opposed the GST and the 1998 tax reforms. Remember the uh, uh, Kevin Rudd's uh, famous speech where he said the day on which the GST would become law would be known forever as fundamental injustice day. The single most important tax reform in our lifetimes undertaken by the coalition in the teeth of opposition from the Labor Party and denounced by the now leader of the Labor Party as fundamental injustice. And this is the same man who claims that no economic reform has ever been undertaken other than by the Labor Party. It is truly Orwellian. He has the capacity to look down the lens of the camera and say black is white and hope that if he says it often enough, people will start to believe it. Now, since the end, of 2007, since the change of government, we've experienced a Labor government quite unlike its reformist predecessors in the Hawke and Keating years, except for an eerily familiar attraction to debt and deficit. They've been happy to throw a quarter of a century of economic liberalism overboard and use this global downturn as an excuse for an agenda that harks back to the 1970s. And uh, as I noted at the outset, in his essay earlier this year, the Prime Minister proclaimed or declaimed, denounced, the great neoliberal experiment of the past 30 years has failed. 
great neoliberal experiment of the past 30 years has failed. Can he explain how it was a failure for Australia to finish that period with all of the challenges, the global financial crisis, with the strongest banking system and public finances of all major developed economies? Can he explain how it was a failure that under the coalition government, John Howard's government, Australians enjoyed strongly rising wages, the lowest unemployment for generations and low inflation? And can this Prime Minister, whose capacity for propaganda is boundless, explain how dumping the successful policies of the past 25 years and unleashing a reckless spending spree unprecedented in peacetime is going to help secure the long-term success and prosperity of this nation? Only this week, we've seen, only today and yesterday, we've seen his deputy, Julia Gillard, struggle to explain there's no explanation for it, of course, no wonder she's struggling, but struggle to explain how it can be in the public interest to spend two and a half million dollars of taxpayers' money on demolishing four perfectly serviceable classrooms at the Abbotsford Public School in Sydney so that four perfectly serviceable classrooms can be built in their place. <laughs> and this is part of a $15 billion spending spree on school assembly halls. Think about it. Think about it. Fifteen billion dollars spent on school assembly halls right across the country, whether the halls are needed or not, whether they're wanted by the community, school community, whether they're suitable or not, doesn't matter. They're going to come. The Julia Gillard Memorial Assembly Hall is coming to a primary school near you, and it will be accompanied by a very large sign that by law will have to be affixed to the exterior of the school until March 2011, which is the latest date by which the next federal election can be held. It is a breathtaking cynicism, but that is the government we face today. Now, let's recall the road that Geoffrey described uh, in the lead up to the 1909 merger between the protectionists, led by Alfred Deakin. There he is, that handsome bearded gentleman whose descendants are with us tonight. And the free traders, uh, historically dominated by George Reid, whose descendants apparently are not here with us tonight. Um, now, Geoffrey, uh, I was discussing with Tom Harley whether he thought in 1909 whether I would have been with Deakin or George Reid. My, possibly my New South Wales mercantile nature would have made me closer to George Reid, but Tom thinks that my soft heart would have made, kept me with uh, Deacon. Who knows, I would have been a natural advocate for fusion. But the, now, as Geoffrey has described, the Labor Party has always sought to characterise politics in Australia as split between Labor and non-Labor. And viewed through this perspective, the 1909 fusion to form a Liberal Party was nothing more than a marriage of necessity between two parties, one avowedly anti-socialist and committed to small L liberal values of free trade, uh, and the other protectionist, and in the style of the British Liberals, the Whigs, with a policy platform involving more uh, rather than less state intervention. Now indeed, uh, Alfred Deakin's protectionist, as Geoffrey reminded us, had prior to fusion sought its support from the Labor Party ignoring the warning of George Reid that those who seek to ride the socialist tiger will inevitably be devoured by it. However, while the protectionists and the free traders differed on important issues of policy, which is what they stood for, their platform, they recognised a common commitment to whom they stood for. The parties of the fusion, just as the Liberal Party of 2009, stands above all for those men and women of enterprise Robert Menzies described in his Forgotten People speech of the 22nd of May, 1942. I regard that speech as arguably the most important political speech given in our history. It is both practical, it's a speech of its times, there are parts in it that are very much speaking in, as a political leader in the middle of the war, and there are parts of it that are absolutely timeless. It's a remarkable speech, and it's good, Heather, that we have in view here as a 
the daughter of Sir Robert Menzies, here tonight. Menzies described the men and women that he stood for, and this was, of course, was before the foundation of the modern Liberal Party, as the middle class. He, and quoting him, salary earners, shopkeepers, skilled artisans, professional men and women, farmers and so on. They are for the most part unorganised and unselfconscious. They are envied by those whose benefits are largely obtained by taxing them. They are envied by those whose benefits are largely obtained by taxing them. They are not rich enough to have individual power. They are taken for granted by each political party in turn. They are the backbone of the nation. As true today as they were in 1942. He astutely observed that the captains of industry, the controllers of vast corporations, will be able to look after themselves. And he recognised the single most important truth about the character of our opponents, which is that the Labor Party is the political wing of the trade union movement. There is a labour movement. It has an industrial wing, the trade unions, and a political wing, which is subordinate to the industrial wing. Labour is a machine, it was in 1942, it is today. Its strategies and policy is dictated by an organisational elite drawn almost invariably from the professional organisers and officials of the union movement. That has always been the case with Labour, but what has changed is that the men and women who run the union movement and graduate from those, from those roles to Parliament no longer come with real life experience as workers. For almost all of modern Labor's representatives, and my colleagues and I get to observe them at close quarters in the Parliament, manual Labor is indeed a Mexican bandit. Uh, labor, <laughs> labor has become more and more the product of an elite, a professional political class, a nomenclatura, so to speak. And you may well have, you might have, might have heard Alan Jones run through some calculations uh, on what we might call the work experience of the Rudd government. It's a lengthy analysis, and I won't go through it all with you tonight. But when you examine the collective career histories of 181 years of the six leading members of the government, from Mr Rudd down, there's only a total of 13 years in the private sector. And of those 13 years, 11 were spent as trade union lawyers. Now, this is one of the most important differences between the modern Liberal Party and the modern Labor Party. There is almost no private sector experience on the front bench of the Rudd government. It is a government almost exclusively of political apparatchiks, union officials and public servants. On our side, we have the widest range of life's experience with every conceivable, some would say inconceivable, uh, profession and occupation represented. Our party room is characterised by diversity, just as Alfred Deakin and George Reeds were, labours by homogeneity. And what is remarkable is that the diversity of our side of politics has been consistent throughout our whole history. And perhaps, just as importantly, it established the tradition of a broad church capable of encompassing diverse intellectual and philosophical strands, free traders and protectionists, conservatives and liberals, urban and rural interests alike. And that tradition lives on today. Within today's Liberal Party, as indeed within today's coalition, there are, as there should always be, vibrant and vigorous exchanges over the best ways forward for this nation. Unlike Labor, it has never been our practice or tradition to expel or sanction those within our party who dare to put a different view. We assemble on our side of the parliament free thinking individuals from a wide range of backgrounds, each bringing to the national debate their own unique perspectives and their own direct practical experience of business and society out in the real world. Unlike the trade union officials and political hacks of the Labor Party, our strength as liberals is to reflect the diverse grassroots organisation we represent. And that, my friends, is our tradition on our side of politics. And when you 
reach out through the decades, through more than a century, and you ask yourself, what is the essential DNA? Cutting through the policies of the day, because every generation will have different challenges, as Quinton Hogg, who many of you would know, as, as recall, as Lord Hailsham, a very distinguished minister in Margaret, Margaret Thatcher's government, a Lord Chancellor, no less, as indeed I think his father and grandfather had been. But as Quinton Hogg observed about the British Conservatives, they've always defended the same ground. In the 19th century, defending the importance of the state against the challenges of laissez-faire liberalism, which was in a, that was a very, um, if you like, extreme version, uh, argued for in the 19th century, and then in the 20th century, turning around to face the challenge of the socialists and the uh, dominant state, uh, eliminating any role for free enterprise and the, and the individual. But as, as Hogg wrote back in 1947, in, that, in his great work, The Case for Conservatism, he made the point that the conservatives have always been defending the same ground against different foes. And we too, as liberals, will always be facing different challenges. But the values we defend and the people we defend are values of freedom and of enterprise. And they are timeless. Because that DNA of labour, our opponents today, is a DNA, a political DNA, which says government knows best. We see that in their schools program. When we were in government, we invested in schools, but we reached out when Julie was education minister and we said, what do you want? What do you want to do? You tell us what your dream is for your school. And so we then responded to that. Julia Gillard doesn't reach out at all. She says, you're getting the Julia Gillard Memorial Assembly Hall whether you like it or not, regardless of what has to be demolished or overwhelmed. Completely different view of the world. So when Labor says government knows best, or government should be at the centre of the economy, to quote Kevin Rudd, what do we say in response? We say, as Liberals have said for more than a century in Australia, we believe government's role is to enable you to do your best. Because we believe in the dignity of the individual. We believe it today, as Menzies did, as Deacon did, as George Reid did, we believe in the dignity of the individual and we believe government's role is to enable that individual, that family, that small business to do their best to realise their dreams. Now, we saw with Menzies dark days. Menzies saw dark days when he lost the election in 1946, he wondered whether he had fundamentally misread the temperament of the Australian people. Just as, as Deacon wondered, as Geoffrey described to us, when he had been defeated, whether he was defeated, whether Labor's victory was going to be, uh, if not eternal, at least uh, very long term. But the reality is that, as Geoffrey said, the great Ferris wheel of politics turns faster and slower, but then will stop and change direction. And we have to recognise that as long as we hold to the values, those liberal values of freedom, of respect for the individual, of defending the dignity of the enterprising men and women that Menzies wrote about in 19, or spoke about in 1942. As long as we remember that it is those people, the lifters, not the leaners, that we are defending, then our time will come. Because the truth is, the wealth of this country, the future of this country, the prosperity of our children and their children after them, is built on enterprise and initiative, on hard work and perseverance. It's built on courage and resilience. And it is those values of 
the people that Menzies described as the forgotten people, the middle class, the people of enterprise, the people that want to have a go, that want government to help them do their best but not get in the way. Those people who know that freedom is the answer to enabling them to realise their dreams, those are the people we seek to enable and seek to empower. And as we fulfil our service to them, so, my friends, we will return once again to government and deliver to this country the prosperity, the freedom and the future that our great nation deserves. Thank you very much.